Окей. Здравствуйте и добрый вечер, друзья. Извини, мне по-русски не хорошо, so I will be doing this talk in English today. Okay, let's get going. Uh, so there's basic information about me. You got most of that already. Contact information, feel free to drop me an email or a tweet or whatever. Uh, pretty much on all the services, I'm headiest in some form. So you'll, you'll be fi able to find me pretty easy. Uh, so as mentioned, I work on JRuby. I've managed to be full-time JRuby uh, co-lead for the past 10 years. So we must be doing something right. Uh, we're currently working for Red Hat. Very happy to uh, have their support and they've been, uh, been an excellent place for us to continue working on JRuby. Now in the process, <coughs> in the process of working on JRuby, can I get a water? Does somebody have a water bottle around one of the organizers? Is it around here? Oh, is this me? All right, this, yeah, okay, let's go with that. Okay, so in the process of working on JRuby, there have been a lot of challenges over the years. Uh, I mentioned these in my talk yesterday, dynamic language, uh, the fact that it's a dynamic language, you have to do dynamic dispatch. We want to try and optimize Ruby as much as possible, so there's always been challenges with that. Invoke dynamic, Grawl, and other features that have come, come along over the, time, over the years have made that a little bit easier. Uh, we have to support multiple encodings for strings, and this is what my talk was about yesterday. Uh, in Ruby, each string can have its own encoding, uh, unlike in Java where everything is UTF-16. So this involved a lot of code porting, a lot of uh, extra work, uh, and a lot of duplication of libraries on the JVM that wouldn't be able to work without uh, uh, UTF-16 strings. Uh, startup time has always been a continuous problem for us. Uh, we're hoping that the Java 9 work to uh, add an ahead of time compiler to the JVM will help us uh, get a little boost there. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about native library integration. Uh, Ruby is uh, a dynamic language that's kind of just written around, written as a wrapper around C functions. Uh, so people expect to have POSIX behaviors when they call some of these functions. Uh, they expect to be able to use native libraries directly from a Ruby application. And so we had to be able to support this as well. So, what sort of native calls are we talking about? Well, like I mentioned, uh, POSIX calls, like operating system level things, uh, dealing directly with the file system, with file permissions and so on, spawning processes uh, and controlling them and interactively working with them, uh, being able to stat files and stat file descriptors to see uh, whether they're open, whether they, what the file system details are, are for them, uh, TTY, PTY stuff, uh, being able to control the terminal. So all, all that kind of stuff has to be supported. Uh, graphics libraries, crypto libraries, NoSQL, databases, uh, all the different uh, C libraries out there that the Rubyists expect to use, we need to be able to call as well. Uh, Ruby also has its own C extension API. Uh, unfortunately, we can't support it because it's a bit invasive, it doesn't fit well into the JVM, so instead we need to be able to at least wrap those C libraries and call them directly from Ruby code. Uh, and then there's all sorts of other languages and runtimes that we want to be able to call. People are using Ruby to script LLVM, to script Clang, uh, to connect up to V8. Uh, so we need to be able to do those things too. So a simple case that we'll look at to start, to get the current process ID. So this is actually very tricky to do on the JVM. There are a few hacky ways. Uh, I believe one of the uh, JMX management beans that come with the JVM, you can uh, do a two string on it and parse that string. And within that string embedded in there is the PID of the current process. Obviously pretty cumbersome, uh, pretty fragile. Uh, and it turns out that to get, PID, the, to get the, PID, the current process ID for this process is a very trivial function. We should just be able to call this from the JVM if we need to get the current process ID. Uh, here's our, our little snippet of the, the man page. Uh, it's going to return a PID T, which on most platforms is just going to be uh, basically a long value. Uh, and there's not much to this call. So let's see what it takes these days uh, to, to actually bind this function and call it. So we're going to look at you, what, what, what it takes with Java Native Interface. Uh, so JNI has uh, been around for a long time, first standardized in about Java 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, not a lot of changes since then. A few functions that have been added, a few functions that have been deprecated, but largely about the same. Uh, and 
Everyone always says it was designed to be hard to use, and I say mission accomplished. You did a great job of making Jay and I really painful to use. Uh, designed to be hard to use, sort of to discourage people, at least at the time, from wanting to call all the C libraries that they had available. Write it in Java was the, encouraged, the, the way that they were encouraged to go. Uh, so let's see what we got. We've got our user code that we want to make the get PID call up at the top. Uh, that'll have to make a, a call to a JNI endpoint, a native function somewhere. Uh, and then on the other side, there'll be some code that, uh, that implements that native function. And eventually we get into the get PID, into the C library, so we can make our call. Uh, so it starts out looking pretty easy, right? Uh, we just stick this native on there, and now, hey, wow, we've got native calls. We're actually calling out of Java into the C world, and we can just call it directly. Uh, but then it starts to get a little scary. Uh, how do we bind that native function? Well, we have to run Java H. That will generate a header file for us and some stub implementations. Uh, now that starts to look a little bit scary, especially if you're a Java developer that does not know a lot of C code. We're way out of our element at this point. Uh, okay, but this is just the header file. You know, it's, it's a little bit scary, but we'll move on from here. We have our implementation of the actual get PID call here, which doesn't look too bad. Uh, an, an incredibly mangled uh, function name here, so it knows how to bind it into the right place in the, in the JVM, but it's not too bad. So, okay, we got that working. Well, now we have to figure out how to build it across platforms. We have to figure out how to distribute a native library with it. And this is, again, pretty awful for anybody who works on the JVM. We don't want to have to do this stuff every time we use a native function. And we're just trying to call get PID here. It's a simple function that returns a long value. Why do we have to do all this nonsense? So why is this, why is this so bad? Let's, let's go through a few of the reasons that, are, that make this cumbersome. Well, C requires a very different skill set. Uh, it's very difficult to, to be both a Java developer and a C developer and do excellent job on both of them. Uh, and we're, we want to focus on Java. We want to be Java developers. That's what we're writing. Having to drop down into C and then potentially write make files and other things is not really what we want to be doing. Uh, we want to get work done on the Java platform. Uh, again, building these shared libraries across platforms is a pain. You need to either distribute them or make sure that anybody who uses the library has a way to build it. Uh, so that means providing make files, providing configure files, all of that sort of stuff, uh, way outside of what we usually do as Java developers. And we just really want to call one function here. Uh, the JNI API is also very extensive and kind of arcane. It's very easy to make mistakes, uh, to accidentally pin objects in memory, uh, to cause seg faults, to cause leaks, all sorts of problems with just trying to learn the JNI API itself uh, on top of being able to be a good C developer and, and, and build the actual library. So what are we going to do? We do need this. We need to be able to call these libraries. Uh, there's always some little bit piece on the C side that we need to be able to use. Uh, so what are some examples of this? Well, for example, NIO, when it came along, uh, was uh, just basically a bunch of C libraries that tried to emulate uh, libc, POSIX, uh, IO operations. Uh, if we had an easier way to do this, we wouldn't have had to wait for the JVM to support it. And then again, NIO2 better file system management. Can't make those calls directly from the JVM, so we had to wait for it to come along as part of the, the Java platform. Uh, lots of libraries these days use unmanaged memory, avoiding the overhead, the cost, the hassle of having everything on the heap, bogging down the garbage collector. Uh, and how do we do it? Well, we route through unsafe, we use other tricks, uh, we might use byte buffers, all very icky, cumbersome ways to work with unmanaged memory. We'd like to be able to just say, allocate a block of memory, uh, give it this general structure, and let me use it from within Java. Uh, standard I.O. and process I.O. on the JVM, uh, you may have noticed there's no way to get a selectable channel, an NIO selectable channel from either of these. Very difficult to do interactive console applications or to control a subprocess interactively. Uh, most of these streams are buffered. Uh, they're not going to be very good for uh, an interactive process control. Uh, and then other types of sockets. Uh, for example, if we want to be able to do ICMP sockets or Unix sockets, uh, we don't have a good way to do that on the JVM. So if we're working in a, a secure environment where we want to use a Unix socket to connect to a database, well, we can't do that generally on Java. We need to have our system administrators open up a TCP port, and then we have to fight with them to show them that it's going to be secure. So, I mentioned the other libraries as well, graphics, crypto. There's always little bits and pieces, new stuff that comes along in the native world, in the C world. So we want to have a way to do this. 
Uh, and the real problem with this is that we have to write these two pieces. We have to write the JNI call on the Java side, and we have to write the C call on the other side. So there must be a better way to do this. And this is where we get into the Java native runtime. So the Java native runtime is a project we've worked on alongside JRuby to support JRuby. Uh, it's a Java API for calling out to native code. Uh, it also comes with a very rich runtime library. We've set up a whole bunch of different C calls and C libraries ahead of time for you, so you may be able to just start using them directly. Uh, and I'll, I'll work, with, work through those as we get going here. You may be familiar with JNA, uh, the Java Native Access Library, uh, very similar to at least one part of the JNR, the Java Native Runtime, uh, but we've done a lot of work to uh, have better performance and, and more features built into the system. Uh, there it is in uh, GitHub. The whole family of projects is under JNR, the JNR uh, organization. So what this basically is is a Java API for binding native libraries and native memory and calling and passing them around. Without writing any C code, without having to build any library, you can just write some Java code, tell it to call a C function, and you're ready to go. So this is what it looks like in JNR. Uh, and instead of having to write all of those pieces on the C side and the JNI side, uh, you just write your user code up at the top. The rest of this logic is generated for you on the fly uh, so that you can start using C functions immediately. Here is the actual get PID implementation, the entire get PID implementation if you use JNR. Uh, and this is a bit of code from JNR FFI, which is the API most of you would be familiar, will, will be interested in. We have our interface where we define the, uh, the function prototype for the get PID function. Uh, as I mentioned, pretty much everywhere it returns a long value. We have our library, lo library loader create a new instance of the get PID uh, that is hooked up to the C library, and then we call it. That's it. There's no C code involved. There's no make files. There's no gnarly command line to build this thing. Uh, this is all you need to be able to call out to a C library with JNR. Pretty cool. So I mentioned that it's got kind of a layered runtime. We've got a lot of support libraries here. Uh, we're going to walk through most of these today. So first of all, JFFI, we'll get this out of the way. Uh, so JFFI it stands for Java Foreign Function Interface. Uh, this is basically our wrapper. Our, this is the only native part in the JNR project. Uh, it's a wrapper around libffi, which is a C library for programmatically loading functions and calling them uh, without having them bound statically into the code. Uh, this is not the API you're looking for. This is our low-level piece that we use to actually wire up the different C libraries. Uh, so it's not what you'd be using normally. But it does have broad platform support. We have lots of different platforms that we've built for, that we maintain it for. Take a look at those in a second. There it is, JFFI, uh, JNR slash JFFI on GitHub. Uh, here is, I think, a, a mostly complete list of the platforms we support. Uh, anybody have a platform they're using that is not on this list? I don't believe you. Know, I, I want to hear about that. I saw one hand. I'd love to hear what platform that is. Uh, We've got some weird ones here. Uh, the folks that have helped contribute to this are really confused why we have some of these platforms, in fact, uh, like OpenVMS and AS400 down here, uh, S390X, uh, IBM mainframes, uh, Spark version 9. How many people still have old like Spark stations that they're using? Not a whole lot. But these have all been contributed by people who have a need. They're running on some of these platforms. Oddly enough, there's people using JRuby on OpenVMS. Uh, and they needed a way to call C libraries along with uh, all their other Ruby code. So if your platform isn't up here, let us know. It's pretty simple to get it built, and we'd, we'll include it and have another platform added to our list. All right, so let's move on from JFFI uh, to JNR FFI. Uh, this is the, the API that you're looking for, the one that you will probably want to use. This is the user-oriented API. So it's roughly equivalent to what you get in JNA. Uh, that's what you saw with the get PID code. Basically, define an interface, tell it to load a library, and it, it wires the whole thing up. Uh, you can also do, you can call into functions, but you can also define structures, uh, native memory structures, and it will allocate them appropriately and give you a Java-like interface to call into the fields of, of that structure. Uh, I don't, I don't know if JNA supports this yet. It, in the past, it did not. Uh, but we can actually pass Java functions out to C calls as well. So if we wanted to do, uh, for example, a, a native Q sort 
uh, at, the, at the C level. You can provide an interface, pass your Java implementation out, and it will use that for the comparison. Uh, and then, of course, if we can allocate structs, we can also work with arbitrary types of memory and access them directly. There it is on GitHub, JNR-FFI. Uh, there's also another project in there called JNR-FFI Examples uh, that provides a whole bunch of different use cases that you can look through uh, on your own time and, and kind of get an idea of how to use the API well. So some people might ask, why, why do we do this on our own? Why did we build this instead of J and, just, and just not just use JNA, the Java Native Access Library? Uh, well, so first of all, the JNA stuff was not quite low enough to build all the other APIs that we needed to do. Uh, we had no support for any preprocessor constants, and I'll get into why that's important later. We uh, also had a whole bunch of standard APIs that we wanted to build. Uh, JNA didn't provide any of those out of the box, so we would have had to do a lot of work to bind all those uh, and get them ready for use anyway. Uh, the callbacks thing I mentioned was able to pass callbacks out to C, and the performance of JNA in a lot of these scenarios is not what we were looking for. Uh, JNR generally outperforms it. So here's a, a little bit more complicated example of JNR FFI. Uh, we have a struct here, so our time val struct that represents the, uh, the time val struct at the C level. Uh, it has two fields, tvsec and tvusec for the microseconds. Uh, and these are built-in types that are, are provided with JNR FFI, uh, time t and signed long, set up so that they know what the size of those types are on the C on the, and the platform that you're running on. Uh, and then we have a basic constructor that just passes our runtime through. Here is our binding for the get time of day function, which is what we're going to call with our time val. Uh, so we're marking the time val parameter as an out parameter. So we want uh, whatever values are written into that pointer from the C code to be brought back up into the Java space. Uh, and it's transient, so we don't need the pointer that's behind that structure to remain in the C world after we've made this call. We want to call out, populate the structure, and then get it back. Lots of different uh, annotations in JNR FFI to let you control exactly how you want to use these C calls. Uh, and in this case, we're not using the, the time zone field or the time zone parameter, so it's just kind of an unused pointer here. Here, uh, similar to the get pid code, uh, we create a new instance of our libc uh, class, wrap it around libc at the, at the native level. Uh, we create a new time val struct, just like we would any other Java object. Uh, we make our call, and it goes out to C. It populates the time val structure, and now we have the fields available to us, so we can use them directly. Not too bad. And again, this is the only code you need to write for, is these three slides. No C code that you have to write behind the scenes. So moving up from there, moving to some of the support libraries that we've created on top of JNR FFI. So I mentioned preprocessor constants. So in order to be able to call most C functions and most C APIs, you need to be able to have all of the defines that are available, uh, the defines that are in the C function. Uh, for ex uh, let's see, several platforms. Eh, there's, there's the GitHub stuff. Go to an example. Here's some of this sort of constants that we provide. Um, address family and uh, socket information for sockets. Uh, FCNTL uh, values for, uh, for file control. Uh, all the Erno values at the C level. These are the sorts of things that you have to know when you're interacting, interacting with a C library. And so we provide a way to both generate these on a cross-platform basis and use them as normal enums. Uh, I mentioned sockets. Here is the socket call at the C level. Uh, and we have domain type and protocol here. Uh, these have constant values that we're supposed to pass in to specify what type of socket we want to create. Uh, so for domain, we have the uh, protocol family constants. These are all provided as part of JNR constants, so you can use it and create native sockets. Uh, several of these types of sockets you can't even create on the JVM normally, but with JNR FFI, you can call down and, and get those sockets and create them. Uh, the type of socket, here we have streaming, datagram, but we can also create raw sockets. We can create other types of sockets, maybe the ones that are specific to a particular platform. Again, not something that we normally can do with Java without writing C code to do it. And I mentioned that these are just enums, so they fit very nicely into the rest of the Java world. You make your call to these functions with one of the enum values from JNR constants, and we pass it down into the C code using the right value for that platform. 
Okay, so now we can, we've got our, we can make our C calls, we can get all of our C constants out of the, the C library. Uh, let's just bind some of this stuff for you. So JNR POSIX is a pre-bound set of a whole bunch of different POSIX functions. Uh, I'll get to a, a complete list, but these are the ones that we've needed in JRuby over time. So as we've needed them, we've added some bindings, made sure they work across platforms, and then provided them as a library for you so that everybody else can take advantage of it. Uh, JRuby works on this. Uh, also, the Jython project has helped contribute to this, and there's a few other folks out there. Uh, like I said, mostly driven by what we've used. If there are C functions that you need that are part of libc and not in this library, let us know and we can add them. Uh, the, our goal is that 100% of all of the POSIX functions will be bound into this library. So if what you need is just standard library, uh, st standard lib, standard IO, the standard libc functions from, uh, from native world, they should all be here, ideally. We also provide a partial pure Java backend. For the things that we can emulate on top of the JVM, we have a Java version for those cases where you can't load any native libraries, you can't actually call down to the C level. So for some things, you can kind of get by with not doing it. This is a partial list of the functions that are provided. Uh, for example, before we had NIO2, we couldn't do things like chmod and chown. We couldn't change ownership and, and permissions for a particular file. Uh, we have fork bound, and that certainly does not work on the JVM, even though we have it up there. Uh, forking the JVM does all sorts of horrible things to it, so it's, it's entertaining. You should give it a try. Uh, getting PID again, here is our get PID function already, so now you don't even have to write the get PID code. We've already done that for you, so you have it available. Uh, for that alone, this library may be worth it if you're trying to pass a PID out to some process management uh, tool that you have on your system. Uh, and then, you know, just going down the list, lots of stuff that we've got available. We've got stat, we've got time, so we can actually get pro CPU times that are being spent in a particular thread or process, uh, and there's many more than this. And like I say, if there's something that we don't have in JNR POSIX, let us know. So, building on top of JNR POSIX, building on top of JNR FFI, we have ENXIO. What's that well, mouthful of words? So this is extended native cross-platform IO. Uh, this is basically NIO channels, an NIO compatible library that uses all native C calls. So it behaves the way that a C program would need to, but provides you an NIO channel that looks like any other IO uh, object on the JVM. So, for example, we can do things like select on standard IO. We can do select and, and have selectable channels for a subprocess, uh, things that you just can't do on the JVM normally. We also have full access to file control uh, flags, so we can change the way that file descriptors are working uh, in ways that aren't possible in the JVM normally. Uh, there's where the project's at, JNR slash JNR dash ENXIO. Uh, so this is basically the, the, the important API, the primary API in, ENX, in, in extended native cross-platform I'm gonna need a shorter way to say that, Anxio, maybe. Uh, You'll see we uh, extend abstract selectable channel here, so we have all of the features of uh, the best NIO channels, uh, so we can select on it and interrupt IO operations and so on. Uh, and then you pass in a file descriptor to this. Uh, you can get a file descriptor by calling into one of the C functions like open or socket, uh, or you can pull it out of uh, some of the Java libraries that are available. Uh, most of the other stuff is pretty straightforward. Reading and writing to a byte buffer, uh, shutting down input and output, the rest of this is just kind of standard NIO features. So here, if we actually wanted to get a pair of Unix sockets, for example, we want to communicate uh, with, two, with two Unix sockets, uh, we call our socket pair, um, this is just coming out of JNR POSIX here, we specify we want uh, Unix sockets, uh, that are streaming, uh, so they have a, 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 a protocol uh, similar to TCP for that. And then we just pass the two file descriptors in. Now we actually have two normal Java channels that can use those native file descriptors directly. But of course, we needed Unix sockets. You probably need, may you need Unix sockets for something. So we've also created a library for Unix socket management uh, already prepared for you. So JNR Unix socket is Unix sockets for NIO. Works on any platform that has Unix sockets. You don't have to write the C code yourself and build it. Uh, you can have uh, access to the Unix sockets and call out to databases or whatever else. 
This is, of course, built on top of uh, ENXIO, uh, so it can use all of the features of uh, selectable channels, file descriptors, and so on. Uh, and again, very fully selectable. This is a full-featured NIO channel that will allow you to use Unix sockets directly. There it is on GitHub, JNR-Unix socket. And of course, these are all on Maven. So you can take a look at the project, get the Maven coordinates, uh, and just depend on them, pull them into your library, and you've got access to, to all this stuff. Uh, and now here's the same example. This is essentially what we have in the JNR Unix socket project. Uh, so our socket pair here, now we can wrap it up in Unix socket channel. It basically gives us all the features that you would have if you were doing this at the C level. And it looks like a normal Java channel, so we can call into it directly. Here's a, a more typical example of using a Unix socket. We've got some file on the system that represents a Unix socket. Perhaps it's a, a MySQL socket that's available for us to call into the database. Uh, we create a Unix socket address, similar to how you would do a, a normal NIO socket channel. And then we open up a channel and bind to that address. Now we've got a Unix socket on the JVM. Didn't have to write any code for it. OK. Wow, we're moving fast today. Uh, so JNR process uh, is the, the last library I wanted to cover here. Uh, JNR process is basically another a process library that does it the right way. So let's, uh, let's work through this. Java Lang process has a lot of problems. Uh, the, least, the main one that I ran into is the fact that you can only get streams out of it. Streams can't be selected on, streams can't be interrupted. Uh, and in, 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 on top of that, it actually buffers those streams. So if I want to, say, start up a Vim or an Emacs process under the JVM and script it or control it, it's almost impossible to do. You have to constantly be flushing values. You have to constantly be pumping those streams and pulling data off of them because there's no way to tell when it's ready. Uh, it doesn't work so well. This, again, is built on top of ENXIO. So we've got native descriptors for that process that you've launched. They look like real, full-on NIO channels. So you can actually do selects and other operations on them. Uh, we also use a function that's uh, available on, on pretty much every Unix called POSIX spawn. Uh, this provides a way for us to spawn a subprocess, get the in, out, and error channels, do some other operations to, to tweak the way the process runs, and then control it directly from Java. So finally, we actually can have interactive subprocesses. We can launch a program and control it completely from within the JVM by using JNR process. And there's where it's at. Again, uh, you can pull this in with Maven. It looks and acts pretty much like process builder and process, uh, but you can get channels out of it. Here's what that APA looks like. Uh, the rest of it's pretty much just like Java Lang process, but we can finally actually get real channels out of it. So let's talk a little bit about performance. Uh, we've got all of these C bindings and these libraries that we've created for you. Uh, but the next question is, how well does this actually work? Uh, I'm not writing the C code anymore. You're doing some magic for me. So what kind of performance do we get? Well, we've tried really, really hard to make this library perform well. Uh, we are generating uh, all of the bytecode between your interface uh, for that get PID call. We're generating the, the implementation behind the scenes. Try to make it as tight as possible, as fast as possible. So it's not doing a lot of extra work to call down into the C code. Uh, if you are using JRuby, uh, we actually bind it with Invoke Dynamic. So a call from Ruby can go straight to the native code uh, without any intermediate. Uh, it would be very easy to do something similar for Java with uh, uh, lambdas and so on. Uh, we also have generated the native code for you as well. Uh, at runtime, we generate a little stub that sits underneath the, uh, the JNI function to make that C call as fast as possible. So all the way through, uh, as a result, when you make, a, make that get PID call from the example I showed earlier, there really should only be about two or three hops that you have to do until you're actually in the C library. Uh, compare that with JNA, where there's many levels, or with your JNI C code, where you might have a, a few levels that you've added into it. Uh, just a little sidebar here. Another project that's part of JNR is JNR x86 assembly. Uh, and this is actually a library that lets you uh, sort of a DSL for generating assembly code and binding it into the JVM as a function to call. So this is used internally by JNR FFI to create that JNI stub for you. This is the reason why you don't have to write any C code. 
we create a little function for you that'll do all that magic and make the JNI calls appropriately. So it's a, it's a fun library to play with. If you're interested in doing assembly on the JVM, I encourage you to check it out. So let's see what the performance looks like. Uh, a comparison between J and A, which I mentioned is not so uh, not, not as fast. Uh, it comes out to uh, around about 10 times faster than J and A for at least this get PID call that I've got here. Uh, so already we're doing pretty darn well. Uh, we can actually improve upon this. Uh, normally, when you make one of these calls uh, into uh, JNR POSIX, for example, we will save off whatever the error code was, if there was an error code. Uh, by doing that, it's a little bit more overhead. You can turn that off by saying you do ignore error annotation. I don't care what the error no is, the er error code result, uh, and then it will speed up a little bit. That gives you a, a, about another 25% improvement over uh, capturing the error every time. Uh, but the problem here is that there is a lot more that we need to do. Uh, this at the bottom is running with GCC for making a get PID call. Unfortunately, JNR is still kind of limited by what JNI can do. Uh, we have the overhead of calling out, making sure the JVM is in a good state, uh, making sure that the garbage collector is still allowed to run, and so that overhead adds, adds to what we want to do. It's, it, it's, it's slowing things down much more than we would like. Here's an example of what we actually have at the, at the native code level. This is the assembly code that we see when we're calling our get PID. Uh, and you'll notice down here we're actually doing invoke interface. So first of all, we would like this to actually be the native call. If we're making a call to get PID from Java, why can't it just call the get PID function when the JIT generates this assembly code? So what we'd really like here, rather than doing our invocation, our, our call through to this native function, what we'd really like to see is, this, is something more along this line, where we actually see this native library that we're calling into directly from Java. And we need JVM help to do that. Uh, so this is, this is where we're kind of stuck. We have to force all this stuff through JNI. It makes it a little bit more overhead than we would really like it to be. So what do we want? We want a standard FFI API in the JDK. We want something that's like this, but the JVM knows about it. Uh, we want the JIT to understand how to optimize these calls so that when we make our C call, we don't have to generate the JNI stub and the, all the intermediate code. The JVM knows how to do it for us. Uh, and we want the JVM to do that call as directly as possible. We want to be able to call it directly from the, C, the, native, from the uh, assembly code that's generated. Uh, there's other aspects to this. We'd like to be able to apply security policies to all of our, our, our FFI stuff. And now you can say only load a particular library, but maybe we need something more fine-grained. Maybe we would say you can load the C library, but only use a certain subset of functions there. Uh, we'd like to be able to pr protect, perhaps protect from doing seg faults. Uh, we can detect when we've done a seg v at the native level and maybe recover from it in some way or raise a, an exception rather than crash the entire process. All of these things need JVM help to do. Now, there is good news. Uh, perhaps some of you have seen uh, Project Panama. Uh, Vladimir has been working on this with John Rose and others. Lots of great folks at, the, at, the, at, at Oracle that are putting this stuff together. Uh, and this is, this is going to be coming to a JVM near you soon, soon. Not quite sure when we're going to get it in there. Uh, so Project Panama started basically in response to the problems that we've had writing these native libraries and bindings. Uh, I wrote up a, a JEP, a JDK enhancement proposal some years ago that basically spelled out all of these features that we have in JNR and said, we want these at the JVM level. How can we do this? Well, it's coming along very well. Uh, I recommend you check out uh, Vladimir's talks from, uh, I believe, Joker, he covered some of this. He does talk about this some in the, in the talk that was at JPoint uh, as well. Uh, it's all starting to come together. We're not the only ones that need this feature, and so the JVM will be supporting it soon, too. Okay, and I went a little fast, so we have time for questions. Uh, thanks very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much, Charles. Yeah. Please raise your hands. All right, yeah. questions. Uh, thanks for your talk, and uh, I would like to know, yesterday you mentioned uh, users of uh, the libs you were talking about, and uh, who are the users of those libs besides JRuby? 
uh, of these libraries. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I mentioned uh, JRuby and Jython. Uh, there are, I know there's some projects that are not open. Uh, there's a bunch of companies that use this to bind their C libraries. Uh, there are uh, some projects at Facebook that are using this to call down to the native code. Uh, there are some folks at, at Oracle that use this for, uh, for calling libraries on, on Solaris, for example. Uh, and I mentioned some of the unusual platforms that we have. There's uh, folks that use JRuby applications on OpenVMS. Not all of the features of OpenVMS map so well into Ruby, and they, they use this to actually call into those functions if necessary. So there's lots of folks out there that are using it. Um, I, I haven't even been able to keep track of it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hello, Charles. Could you clarify, please, from a uh, toolset uh, perspective, uh, is your library uh, generate some code in uh, start time, or is it uh, compile time process? Uh, how you approach uh, embeds into development cycle? Okay, so the development cycle of how this works. Uh, it's all done at runtime. Uh, we probably could generate some of this ahead of time, but it's all done at runtime uh, based on whatever platform you're on. So the idea is that we have done the work to have just the smallest piece of JNI that we pre-build for several platforms, and then we generate the additional code that's necessary on top of that uh, based on the platform you're using. Uh, only bytecode or uh, um, native code also? Uh, bytecode and, and native code as well. That's what the JNR x86 assembly project does. Uh, it basically is generating on the fly a C stub, a, a C function that does the call for you and manages passing the values back and forth. Uh, C function not in C code but in uh, assembly. Yeah. Right, yeah, and you, you'll never see that. Uh, that. That's done behind the scenes. Um, it is also possible to turn that off, and not, if, you, if you have, for example, security policies that don't allow loading uh, an arbitrary uh, piece of assembly code into the JVM, we will just go through a, another mechanism that uses libffi. Okay, another question. Um, is it possible to load uh, several versions of the same library, uh, maybe in uh, hierarchical class loaders, uh, case like OSGI, uh, when we have uh, hierarchical class loaders, uh, other approaches. Right, right. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a tricky problem. Uh, so when you're loading libraries on the JVM, they generally load with global symbols. Uh, so the, D, the DL load function at the C level is loading them so everybody can see every C library that's been loaded up. Uh, that's hard to work around in, the, in Java. Load library always does it this way. But since we can actually bind C functions, you can call out to DL load and pass it the appropriate uh, flags to say, oh, load this library, but only let me see the functions. Uh, and now load a different version of that library and let me see those functions separately. So it is possible to do it through this library, uh, which is really not possible to do with load library at, JVM, at the JVM level. Okay, that's the last question. Uh, do you have some numbers other than process ID request? Maybe some network stuff, maybe some uh, open CL, maybe some uh, stream audio, some, some streaming data. Uh, so, so libraries for that, or uh, for p p um, some numbers from performance ah, point performance of view? Numbers. Yeah, no, not just get PID, get PID. Uh, some. Okay. Some streaming data performance. Right, right. Well, so it, uh, there are some numbers we've got. Um, if you take a look at the JNR FFI project, we have some benchmarks in there that are easy to run. Uh, they kind of vary across platforms. Uh, they vary across platforms. They vary across JVM versions. And it depends on what parameters you're actually passing. If you're passing out uh, Java strings, well, that's going to be some overhead to, to translate the strings across. Uh, for a straightforward function, if you can get it to be native pointers and, and simple numbers that you're passing to the C function, uh, the get PID result is kind of what you'll see. Uh, so it, it, it really does vary, and uh, there's a few tricks in the JNFFR, JNR FFI project to help you tweak your calls to, to make them faster. Uh, is it, um, how difficult is it uh, to add um, an implementation of my own library? Uh, shouldn't be difficult at all. Uh, we have some uh, early generation tools that will create the interfaces for you, but if you know what all the types are and what the, what the function parameters are, it's just as easy as creating an interface that passes the right value types around. 
Uh, there are a few that we do uh, special magically for you. So if you say your C function takes a Java string in the interface, we do the translation to turn that into a, a native uh, character array on the other side. Uh, but for most, most libraries, uh, that's, that's really why it's hard to say who's using this, because the most popular use case for this is my company has another project that's written in C. I need to be able to call it easily. Uh, folks use this to bind it up, and it works great. Thank you for the presentation. Is it possible to perform naked C calls to call functions that have no libc robbers? Uh, so native syscall, like it's like raw syscalls. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, we do have syscall bound in POSIX, so you can you can certainly use it. Uh, setting up the stack and all that, I'm not. I don't know how all that stuff works because I don't really. I'm not really a C guy in general, uh, but it is there, and uh, you can go for it. Hi. Hi. Uh, I tried to use the GenRFFI library mm, to call. C Libra, and uh, I uh, had uh, some questions and uh, tried to find some documentation about GenRFFI, and I found only Java docs, and uh, sometimes they, it does, doesn't help much. Mm. So my question, uh, can we expect some comprehensive documentation for GenRFFI in future? Yes, yes. So, so a, a good place to look for some help would be that JNR FFI examples, if you haven't seen that. Um, we have, we're trying to create some better documentation for this. Uh, the, the fellow who worked on this basically did a whole bunch of, uh, it did the implementation of these libraries, wired it up into JRuby, and then we wrote documentation for how to use them in JRuby, rather than uh, the, the documentation that Java folks would need. Now that we're trying to get this out and get more people to use it in the Java world, we're going to clean up some of those interfaces, put more uh, documentation on the, the, the GitHub wiki, uh, so that all of those different use cases are available. So basically, we do have docs for those things, but they're kind of Ruby, JRuby specific at the moment. Uh, we're, we're in the process of translating them over. Uh, thanks for your lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, is it possible to obtain some information about uh, memory uh, used by the process uh, using uh, these uh, native calls? Oh, sure, sure, yeah. So getting, the, getting memory information about the current process. Well, we can get a PID and we can call any of the C functions at the native level that would, would be able to query those things. Uh, I don't know if any of those are bound currently in JNR POSIX, uh, but each platform has their ways of, of determining what memory is being used. So yeah, it, it would definitely be possible to do that. Anything you can do in C, you should be able to do with this. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, two small questions. Uh, one, uh, do you support the Unix style IPC or wrapping? And the second, uh, do you have now or planning support for C libraries? Okay, uh, so Unix style RPC, is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, well, again, what, if you can do it in C, there's a way to do it from, from, uh, from JNR. Uh, it's not something that I have used a whole lot, but there are people that have, that have been doing that. So it should, it should be possible to do with this library. Uh, the C++ question is tricky. Uh, because C++ doesn't have a standard binary format, uh, the way we would usually recommend that you do that is to write a very small C stub around your C++ library so you've got a simple function to call. Uh, we are working on, uh, well, helping to work on a project called JNR uh, Clang, which uses this, the Clang, the Clang uh, library, to basically generate all the JNR uh, information so that you could call into C and C++, uh, but it's still very early for that. Uh, my name is Dmitry. So one of the biggest problems of uh, GNI is if some uh, unrecoverable error happens inside C code, like segmentation fault, then JVM crashed immediately. So it means if JVM uh, runs 100 threads and serves 100 clients, and one thread access GNI with this segmentation fault, all JVM will be crashed immediately with a crash dump. Mm. Uh, how can you avoid this problem with your library? 
Well, so it, it's, it's certainly still possible to segfault the JVM with this, uh, as, as we have seen uh, with, with early versions in JRuby. Uh, the, the best that we re were really able to do is now you, don't have to, you, you at least don't have to write C code, and usually that's where your problems come in. Someone doesn't manage a pointer right, or someone frees memory before it was supposed to be freed. Uh, since we do all of the magic of generating the calls for you, Oops. most of the time, you're not going to see that sort of seg fault. But of course, if you have a bad pointer that you pass out to a C call from, uh, from Java using JNR, it still could definitely seg fault. And that's where I'm hoping that maybe we'll be able to see some JVM help in the future. So it should be, should be fewer seg faults. You don't have the bugs that usually creep into a C program in this case. Uh, but if you really want to seg fault the JVM, you will be able to do it.